nationally famous TV star, is joined by Uncle Sam and Miss America and over 52,000 excited fans to sing God Bless America at America's first official birthday party, the 1975 Liberty Bowl in Memphis, Tennessee. Brought to you by the Liberty Bowl Festival Association and the First National Bank of Memphis. The traditional Liberty Bell in lights on the First National Bank building seems to stand silent sentry over Memphis, proclaiming liberty for all in sight on this eve of the bicentennial year. Memphis, queen of the Mississippi, stands ready to be immersed in the fever that is college football in anticipation of one of the great postseason games, the Liberty Bowl. This year's game takes on an extra dimension of importance because this spot and this game have been selected as the first official bicentennial sporting event, the bicentennial kickoff, the first giant American birthday party. At the First National Bank building, it's all smiles as Bud Dudley, founder of the Liberty Bowl, and Ron Terry, chairman of the board, First Tennessee National Corporation, and a big fan and supporter, look over the program. This year's exceptional cover design is an original painting, Symbols of Liberty, created by the renowned Memphis artist William Nolan Van Powell. weekend of festivities kick off with a riverboat party at the beer stew thanks to the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company. Magnetic Memphis music, the sore dancing feet, the great food and plenty of the sponsors product and the motif of the paddle wheel steamer launches us into Liberty Bowl 1975. And speaking of launching, the morning after, a new event is launched into the Liberty Bowl pregame schedule. And judging by its success, it looks like a real winner. Seemingly, hundreds of small sailing boats joined in the first annual Frostbite Regatta, trying to avoid exactly that, Frostbite, and each other. Fridays in Memphis is the place to be on Saturday. The wives of players, coaches, and officials had cocktails at this popular Overton Square spot before going across the street to the Bombay Bicycle Club for lunch. The Liberty Bell, Betsy Ross, and this floral replica of Old Glory create the mood and atmosphere for a slightly more formal occasion, the traditional black tie dinner and dance. Good food and entertainment in the candlelight setting in the ballroom of the Hyatt Regency House seems like a natural way to spend Saturday night before the Monday night kickoff. Like a jewel sparkling in the Tennessee sunshine, the newly completed Hyatt Regency Hotel, a symbol of modern Memphis, is an exciting backdrop for this year's Liberty Bowl festivities. This unique 25-foot high poinsettia tree in the lobby reflects Christmas magic in Memphis. Playing host to USC, the new hotel's foundation was sorely tested, but the gleaming glass tower withstood the impact of well over 10,000 pounds of football muscle. Southern Cal takes time out from a flurry of weekend activities for a hearty meal at Friday's, a colorful and favorite eating spot in Memphis. But the serious business of football is never forgotten as the Aggies go through a loosening up drill.
bicentennial kickoff is only 24 hours away. The press and school officials try to break the mounting tension at a press reception. Good food, good music, and theories and opinions about the game are in plentiful supply, and everything in Memphis is wearing bicentennial colors this week. The Liberty Memorial Stadium here in Replica awaits its grandest hour. Game day dawns crisp and clear over Memphis. The cold weekend winds have subsided, and weather conditions at game time should be excellent. At the game day luncheon at the Holiday Inn Rivermont, an audience of over 2,000 enjoys a distinguished head table, including the two men of the hour, Aggie coach Emory Ballard and Southern Cal's John McKay. MC, Liberty Bowl past president Don Drinkard, welcomes the large crowd and introduces the head table. Miss America, Tawny Elaine Godin, enjoys a joke with yours truly. And a special guest is astronaut Major General Thomas P. Stafford. Bud Wilkinson, Keith Jackson, and Bill Fleming of ABC TV are here to make tonight's action come alive for 40 million fans around the country. Chuck Muncie, University of California's all-time rushing leader, received Chevrolet's Offensive Player of the Year award. Defensive honors go to tackle Steve Niehaus of Notre Dame. He overcame three knee operations to win this award. He was accompanied by his legendary athletic director, Edward Moose Kraus, who accepted the scholarship award. Speaking of legends, Bear Bryant of Alabama presents the Liberty Bowl's Distinguished Service Award to John McKay. It was a real honor and privilege for me to present this award, wherever it is, to my warm friend, John McKay. Tonight's game will mark the end of a brilliant college coaching career for John McKay. After 16 years and a record of 126 wins, 40 losses, and eight ties, McKay leaves USC as head coach and athletic director. McKay is one of only three coaches ever to have won four national championships. The man who presented today's award, Bear Bryant, is one. The other is Frank Leahy. Both are Liberty Bowl Distinguished Service Award winners. In his years at USC, McKay coached such greats as Anthony Davis, Heisman Trophy winner Mike Garrett and O.J. Simpson. College football in USC will certainly miss this bright and innovative man in its ranks. The Liberty Bowl is proud to have John McKay coach his final collegiate game here in Memphis. The party mood continues right up to game time. Here at the buffet dinner, the symbols of the Bicentennial and the Liberty Bowl are everywhere. With the kickoff just an hour and a hundred yards away, the warm-up has been as exciting as the game. Game time. And a record crowd of more than 52,000 fans turn out to enjoy a classic struggle of what will certainly be one of the most historic of all Liberty Bowls. John McKay, Southern Cal Trojans, Southwest Conference Tri-Champion, Texas A&M. It is an intersectional clash that will be witnessed by millions around the country in the newly named Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium. The thrilling voice of Marguerite Piazza signals the beginning of America's first official bicentennial event, the 1975 Liberty Bowl.
six-ranked Texas A&M comes to the Liberty Bowl following its most successful season in 37 years. Their opponents, the mighty Trojans of Southern Cal, coming off what John McKay admits has been the most frustrating season of his career. As the Trojans kick off to the highly rated Aggies, they know that this is their chance to turn 1975 around, to prove they are a good team, and to make John McKay's finale a success. First, they must stop the Aggies' dreaded running game. This Southern Cal defense played a major role in the Trojan big triumph over Notre Dame and would be a key factor against the winningest team in the Southwest Conference. On the offense, John McKay's workhorse is junior tailback Ricky Bell, the nation's leading ground gainer in 1975. Early in the contest, the Trojans use Bell as a decoy and surprisingly take to the air. During the regular season, USC used the pass only to supplement its potent running attack. But tonight, the visitors from the West Coast clearly are going to shake things up with wide open football. Known more for his scrambling than his passing, quarterback Vince Evans continues to pose a major threat to the defensive-minded Aggies. A drop pass sets up a Southern Cal field goal for the first points of the game. highest-ranked team ever to play in 17 years of Liberty Bowl competition, the Aggies must get their own offense in gear. A short kickoff sets up the famous wishbone, a devastating formation devised by AM coach Emory Ballard while an assistant at Texas. The Aggies balance their ground game with quarterback Mike Jay's arm and the often acrobatic catches of Carl Roaches. The key that makes any wishbone effective is a mammoth fullback. The Aggies 250 pound George Woodard is only a freshman, but he plays like a veteran. This ground oriented offense that helped the Aggies to a 10 and one record and the share of the Southwest Conference crown takes them to the Southern Cal three where an untimely fumble ends that threat. The Trojans defense wins its first head to head confrontation with the A&M wishbone keeping the Texans off the scoreboard. As the first quarter ends Southern Cal turns Ricky Bell loose on its patented wide sweep. The Aggie defenders are looking for Bell, and he can't break anything big. But early in the second period, the Trojans have set up the Aggies for a roundhouse right they hope will stagger them. Too late, AM discovers the strike. Played in, Randy Sermon is all alone, and then caught from behind at the one. It was the long pass that upset AM several weeks earlier when they lost their only game to Arkansas. However, they cannot stop the Trojans' drive, and fullback Mosi Tatupu gives Southern Cal a 10 to nothing advantage. The Aggies are not used to playing catch up football. An awkward pass results in another costly mistake and another opportunity for USC. The Trojans are still thinking past, but the rugged AM front four ruins the try at yet another long bomb. Southern Cal must again settle for three points. of this 17th annual Liberty Bowl increases as both teams are willing to take a few bruises if they can give some. After the Trojans wrestle possession away from Texas A&M, the Aggies come right back with their 19th interception of the year. Lester Hayes, 
a junior who could be one of the country's top defenders in 1976, makes the clutch play. Coach Ballard realizes he must tighten up his wishbone and make some dents in the Trojan defense, but that is not an easy task. The visitors from the Pac-8 conference have come to Memphis prepared for the wishbone. They have shut off the Aggie passing lanes and are rushing extra men to nullify the ground game. When the Trojans force A&M to run its quarterback, as on this play, they have reduced the Aggies' attack to its weakest weapon. Again, USC halts its opponent. A wily John McKay knows now is the time to put the game away to pull off the blackboard, that special plan you say for just the right moment. Here it is. A well-hidden screen pass to college football's number one runner. Give Ricky Bell a couple of blocks in a little room. And it's a 76-yard touchdown. Play shows a key block on all Southwest Conference linebacker Garth Denable by USC guard Donnie Hickman. And a double downfield block by guard Joe Davis, bringing Bell to pick his way to six points. It's a beautiful effort by the junior who will be a leading candidate for the Heisman Trophy in 1976. The surprise of the first 30 minutes has been the wide open Southern Cal offense that puts 20 points on the board against an Aggie defense that was super all throughout the season. It was probably the most unpredictable first half in Liberty Bowl history. And the second half should be just as interesting. But right now, it's time to kick off America's first official bicentennial halftime at the 1975 Liberty Bowl. The Freedom Foundation at Valley Forge rises to the occasion with the combined USC and AM bands and the Spartan Airs drill team from Houston as it presents the reigning Miss America, Tony Elaine Godin, and Uncle Sam on an historical tour of our nation's great leaders, as narrated to a national TV audience by ABC's Bill Fleming. It's hard to know where to start. We can't mention every one. Well, here's Samuel Adams. Right you are. And he certainly was one of the leading spokesmen for the American cause. In fact, if you'll recall, it was Sam Adams who was responsible for those patriots dressed up as Indians who dumped the British tea into the Boston Harbor. That's the way they felt about not being permitted to have representatives in government. The first stars and stripes may have been made by this friend of Benjamin Franklin's in Philadelphia. Well, that's Betsy Ross, and what a beautiful flag. Red and white stripes and 13 white stars on a field of blue. Yes, and how we grew. Industry and agriculture prospered. Eli Whitney had found a new and better way to separate the cotton from its seeds. And a young man named Robert Fulton built a steam-powered boat that really worked. It was an age of progress for America. But disagreement on what powers belong to the states and what powers belong to the federal government, and of course the issue of slavery, set brother against brother. And President Lincoln the tried to get it all straightened out. By the people, for the people, shall not perish of the earth. One of the black men to make an important contribution to America after the war between the North and the South was Booker T. Washington. He founded Tuskegee Institute in 1881 and built it into an educational institution known the world over. We will sing one song for the old Kentucky. There were some great people in music, in literature, and the arts. Mentioning music, Uncle Sam, I know that that's the music of Stephen Foster. Yes, his songs have remained popular through the years. About a hundred years ago, the 
they became a favorite of groups singing a brand new style of popular music. People called it Barbershop Harmony. Lucky Lindy? Sure I do. That's Charles Lindbergh. You should have seen the welcome that those Frenchmen gave that courageous young flyer when he arrived at Le Bourget Theater. He'd flown his single-engine plane for 33 hours from New York to Paris, non-stop, all by himself. Listen to the music. Uncle Sam, I recognize that tune. It's Memphis Blues. Yes, the Memphis Blues was written by W.C. Hanson, who was born right here a jazz trumpeter and a composer. And of course, he wrote the St. Louis Blues, too. Whether you think of America's political structure, our private enterprise economic system, or our spiritual heritage, it's been the courageous individuals who knew what they believed in and who stood up for their beliefs. They have made the United States in these two centuries since 1776. But right now, it's time to do some celebrating. Let's give a cheer. Let's light the candles on the cake. Let's count our blessings. It was shouted first from Memphis at the Liberty Bowl, Happy Birthday, America. Amid a halftime roar of approval and a cascade of fireworks, the bicentennial celebration has been officially launched in Memphis, Tennessee. As both teams return to the field, Texas A&M carries the heritage of a team that was one game away from a perfect season. The Aggies' defense, its strength all year, will go right to work. The big question is, can A&M hold the Trojans without any more points, giving their offense time to get moving? As the second half kicks off, the Aggies seem to hit with a new purpose, as if each tackle might turn the game around. This was the defense many Southwest observers call one of the best in the history of the conference. Many of these seniors had played together four years. They were good at their job. Plays that worked earlier for the Trojans now failed against the fired up crew of Aggies. John McKay, concerned over the staying power of his offensive team, probed to rediscover a weakness in the Aggie defensive. Consistent running by Ricky Bell is not enough, as A&M held USC to a scoreless second half and gave up a total of just 86 yards. But that is only half the war. To overtake the powerful Trojans, A&M needs to mount an offense. They desperately need 20 points. Their runners are puzzled. Bubba Bean and George Woodard blast through the Trojans for valuable yardage, but simply cannot take it all the way. They are frustrated, facing their first scoreless contest in some 50 games. Aggie fans stare in disbelief. In a second half where Texas A&M's defense does everything but put points on the board, it is Southern Cal's defense that comes up with the crusher. The Aggie wishbone of Coach Emory Ballard, so effective in 1975, is now met head on by USC and Concord. The Trojans say no to every A&M thrust. They show they want to win for their own pride and as a tribute to their coach. John McKay finishes his 16th year at Southern Cal with a win.
USC rushing leader Ricky Bell was voted the outstanding player of the game. Yes, USC and John McKay won on the field, but the real winners were the thousands here in Memphis and the millions around the country who shared this historic event. The 1975 Liberty Bowl, a bicentennial kickoff in Memphis. 1975 Liberty Bowl has been brought to you by the First National Bank of Memphis and the Liberty Bowl Festival Association.